Yes. He, I, it's a question of how you define tragedy. If you define tragedy as the royalty having a great fall, uh, then uh, he certainly would not qualify. But my definition of tragedy is not the Aristotelian definition, which is usually someone of nobility or whatever. He had nobility of soul, but he certainly did not come from wealth in any which way and, or rank or anything like that. But as far as his uh, qualifications as a tragic character, absolutely. Because, again, it's my definition of tragedy. He had tremendous drive, tremendous integrity, uh, tremendous passion. These are all things that I feel you must have to qualify for uh, a tragic character. And uh, he fought to the very end against all the obstacles that were in his life that he had to come up against. He never gave in until there was nothing left. And uh, people talk about him, ki him killing himself, which is true enough at the end. But the important thing is not that he killed himself. The important thing is that how he fought so incredibly hard until there was nothing left. And so th then and only then did we have his demise. But as I say, in every which way he qualifies uh, as a tragic character, the passion, the drive, uh, heroic vision, God knows. One of the biggest challenges was uh, in terms of the writing, there, there's, there are so many attacks as the film progresses and so many apparent climaxes uh, in the course of the story. And the thing that I was very wary of was it all becoming a blur, one after another. In other words, each attack that he has or had had to be different in some way. They're all related. But there had to be a, 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 a maybe a slightly different color, which in fact is what happened when he had the attacks. He, he mentioned in the letter that uh, in the letters that he uh, each one was a little bit different than the other. Otherwise, the audience just inundated with uh, with this, and uh, they can just get weary after a while. And that was the one thing I wanted to avoid. And the only way I could avoid that was by finding something new each time, something that different from what caused the last attack, for example, and then using that particular thing. Okay, the, uh, of course, the memories were real. They, they happened in the past. The hallucinations related to his greatest fears, his greatest loves, his greatest detestations or whatever. And, um, and it depended on what they were. Usually the, the, hallucin the hallucinations invariably were very unpleasant. They brought back uh, horrible memories of things, but they, because they're hallucinations, they're, it's a hyper-reality in all those areas. His greatest fears, in particular, came out in the hallucinations because uh, he had this fear that Teo would die because of overwork. And in turn, that would be because he was supporting Vincent. And uh, in, in the memories, that there were areas that, that were areas of sheer joy. It, it brought him such pleasure. Like, for example, when Gauguin first arrived at Arles. And uh, when, when he spoke of the school of the South and things like that. But then there were memories later on with Gauguin and, and uh, other areas which were nightmarish. They, they weren't hallucinatory. They, they, these were things that actually happened, but they were, it went anywhere from joy to horror, depending on what the uh, particular memory was.
Yeah. Well, it, it is a key area. Uh, it was the thing that drove Vincent. And the way I interpreted it as an actor, my interpretation was that he, he felt he was put on this earth to, to fulfill a certain destiny, a certain job, so to speak. And this job was to create a body of work. And this was his super objective, a body of work that would last forever. And so when he talks about finishing his work, he knew early on there was no finishing, no matter how long he lived. He could have lived to 80 or 90 and still on his deathbed, he would have said, ah, the paintings I could have done. But he wanted, as long as he was here, as long as he was alive and breathing and be, being able to work as an artist, he wanted to fulfill his, his, his full potential. That was part of the completion of the work. And until he did that, he was cut short. Uh, my feeling is that he did, in effect, complete his work. He died very young, and he could have done more work. But when you consider how much work he did in such a short period of time, absolutely incredible. He produced more works of genius in, the, in, in such a short period than perhaps any other artist that ever lived. And this in itself was such a huge achievement. But that's the thing that drove him. I must finish my work. And that was a theme that ran throughout the whole movie. Okay, I'll answer that. I would say the next to last scene the scene with Dr. Perron, because he, at that point, he's arrived at an area where he is so desperate and he, he can't go on any longer. He's not allowed to work. He hasn't worked for a couple of months. They won't allow him to. And he, his mind is failing. And in that scene, the, all that comes out, but also other things that come out are, are his, his drive, his need to work more than in any other area, I think. He makes it so clear that without the work, I have nothing. He mentions religion in that scene, which is, I think, very important. And he says, I can very well do without God and without religion. The one thing I can't do without is my work. It's not an attack on religion. It has nothing to do with that. It's, it's a point made how he was so driven and how important the work was. And we see in that scene, perhaps more than anywhere else, although there are other areas that also talk about that, uh, that, that he couldn't survive, literally, without the work. And that was, uh, I would call that one of the, uh, perhaps the most, satisfactory area in the film. There were other areas that were very close to that, but if I had to pick one, it would be that. I hope they take away a few things. I hope they take away, number one, that Vincent was not a martyr. He never saw himself as a martyr. And the idea of him being interpreted that way, he would have found detestable. Unfortunately, he's looked upon that way. There are songs about him today. There are books about him that make him into a Christ-like figure. The point is, he wasn't. He never saw himself that way. He never wanted to be that way. He said himself in the letters that he, he was not a hero. I think he was a hero in many ways. Perhaps one of the reasons he was is because he denied it. But he was heroic in the sense how he, how he fought so incredibly hard against the attacks. He never gave in to them until the very end. 
And that's also one of the things that qualifies him as a great tragic figure. Uh, he, he didn't succumb to them. He, didn't, he, he was overwhelmed by them, but again, only, be, only after the most magnificent battle that I know of. Uh, and that's so important that an audience should, should become aware of that. And of course, they should, if they're not already aware of the incredible struggle and the incredible odds that he had to overcome and that he never gave in. He fought right to the very end. And so when he killed himself, as I said before, it was only because he, there was nothing left. He felt he couldn't work anymore. And that was why he had to die. There was no reason for Teo to support him anymore. And he felt such tremendous guilt anyway because of that. And now that he felt he couldn't work anymore, there was nothing left but death. And it was, in a way, it was the most logical thing in the world, the ending. <laughs> there was an expression that he had when he saw something in his own life. It was usually a painting that struck home. He'd look at it and he would say in Dutch, I'm saying it in English, he said, that is it. You're on the nerve. You, you, you've caught the essence of the, of, of the idea in the painting or whatever, or in terms of the style or in terms of the execution. That is it. And if he could just think that when he saw the movie, I would be thrilled and delighted. I read everything that Vincent ever wrote over and over again, over a period of many years. I had to do that as a writer. And so when I came to the role as, a, as an actor, I already had all the research behind me. And then it was a question of interpreting the letters in terms of what I saw. You can take from someone's letters anything you want. And I tried to be as objective as possible. And in creating the part, I asked, what were the major qualities that made up this man, that made up Vincent? And I took each of those qualities, among them, passion, uh, obsessiveness, love, uh, intensity, remorse, guilt. The remorse and the guilt because of, because of Teo and the fact that he was supporting him all those years and he had nothing to show in return except the work, which is like an oxymoron. And what I did is I took those qualities and I worked on each one over and over and over, over a period of months, even longer than that, until I could relate to any one of them instantly so that when we shot, when we did the movie, I could call on any one of them and it was there. The other thing I did, I took the qualities that he had or the experiences he had or that he spoke of, and I made them into emotion memories. There are some actors who use their own life for emotion memories. That's supposedly the classic method way of working. Uh, the, what I prefer to do is create the emotion memories for the character and relive them over and over again until they become as much as possible, a real experience. And that leads to how he felt. And uh, it could be something about Teo, the, 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 the guilt he felt in terms of uh, his being supported by him and things like that. So I had the emotion memories of the character I had the qualities of the character. I had the super objective of the character. Vincent wanted two things. 
at that point in his life, when he entered, when he entered uh, San Remy. He wanted to find out how to prevent the attacks so that, and this is most important, he could finish his life's work. And I used that in, that, that was a through line that I used in the whole story. It impacted every area in the uh, film. Other things I drew on were the self-portraits. Because I found in the self-portraits, studying them very carefully over a period of time, looking into them, dwelling, I found in his eyes what I thought it, it, it was. It told me what he was thinking, what he was, what he was feeling at that particular point in his life. That was part of the genius of his of his talent, and. That impacted, depending on what period it was in, in terms of the movie and where it took place. The other thing was, which is extremely important, was what people said about him, uh, particularly the people who were the most intelligent, the most perceptive, and the ones who had no axe to grind. People like Roland the Postman, people like Mendes de Costa, his teacher in Amsterdam, People like Teo. Uh, these were very unusual people and outstanding people, each in their own right. And every one of them found Vincent to be an extraordinary human being. And there were many others who, in the course of his life, in retrospect, had bad things to say about him, which I won't go into now, but they had an axe to grind. And I wanted to be purely objective about that. And it was very heartening to see that these great people like Roland and Mendes and Teo spoke so highly of him uh, without any ulterior motive. And they, they told me in their letters, in their reminiscences about him, things about him which were so important to me in creating the character. Uh, and th that was extremely helpful. And I used other things as an actor, psychological gesture, to find something that could sum up in a gesture what he wanted. And the, the, the two things that he did, he was reaching, trying to get through to people. And the other thing was he was so open in terms of nature. He had to be as an artist. And he absorbed things like a sponge. Not just the outdoors, he could go into a room that was foreign to him and he could absorb the atmosphere. And atmospheres were so important and that's how he was able to paint them and, and create them in, in such an incredible way. And he had idiosyncrasies about him and habits. Uh, there were some people who remarked about the fact that uh, in the film there's a lot of stammering when he speaks, Vincent. But the fact is that when he spoke, Vincent, when he got, when he got passionate about things, which was about 80 or 90 percent of the time, he did stammer uh, because his, his, his feeling was so far ahead of his ability to express himself. And uh, I used that throughout the movie. Uh, very important. So it was things, all things like this that enabled me to develop the character the way I wanted and the way I saw him. A big question that everyone asks, or everyone has an opinion on, especially the, the uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, ad finitum, ad nauseum, is Vincent's mental condition, his so-called madness, epileptic, uh, schizophrenia, oh, that's a big one. And now it's bipolar because that's very popular. Uh, tinnitus, uh, he, he supposedly was eating his paints, so when he painted, he would uh, lick his fingers, uh, go on and on and on. And these are the things that brought on the attacks and one thing and another. Uh, I don't buy into that. Uh, my feeling about it is, first of all, I think it's overblown, but it is an, it is an important part. There's no escaping it. And uh, I think Vincent was singular in his madness, so-called, 
as he was in his art. And to go and try to define it by saying it was bipolar or schizophrenic, to me, is a terrible error. He wasn't schizophrenic, because if he was, there would not have been a steady growth in his, in his life as a painter, the ten years, actually eight years, eight and a half years he painted. Uh, schizophrenics are not constructive in their life. He was. He was always growing. He was always developing. When he could no longer develop, that's when he took his life. When he could no longer deal with the attacks, which he felt were imminent, and he had no control over them. But his illness came on primarily, I feel, because of how he lived and because of who he was as a person, his personality. Hypersensitive to his surroundings. And he was so empathic that he was a realist, in spite of what people think. And because he was, he could see things the way they really were. And because of that, and because of his enormous empathy, he could so totally identify with people and things. And he saw many of the horrors in life. He also saw the beauties too, but the horrors overcame him because he's so identified with them, he saw them so clearly. That plus his living habits, his drinking, uh, his, his eating habits, which were atrocious. He'd go three or four days on, on 20 or 30 cups of coffee, nothing else. And you can't live that way and have a normal mental constitution. There's no way. All these things contributed to, to the attacks. Uh, and it broke him down. And the irony is they, they say he had a weak constitution, just the opposite. He had a tremendously strong constitution. Anyone else who went through what he went through and had his empathic personality would have been, wouldn't have lasted one quarter of the time that, that he did. But I never interpreted him as a madman. He went through attacks of madness, but he had such lucidity in all the times in between, which was the bulk of the time. He could come off an attack and after a week recover from it, and he was perfectly lucid. You don't have this with people who are mad. And so uh, I, never, I have never bought into that. And I hope in my interpretation of it, it comes across that way, that it was more the living habits and his personality more than anything else that contributed to the so-called attacks of madness.